Formula One fans, this is your Formula One News Hour, and I'm your host, Jonathan Steele. It is good to be back with you. Unfortunately, we haven't been able to bring the Formula One News Hour the last couple of weeks, as my uh, daytime job kind of got in the way. But uh, we're back, and uh, we don't foresee any missing any other weeks here going forward uh, for, the, for the foreseeable future. And, of course, next week, and we start with the Azerbaijan uh, Grand Prix, uh, we've had this long hiatus, a long a month. It's just like, the, you know, they pretty much take a month off in the summer as well. But this one was forced upon the Formula One world with the Chinese uh, bowing out uh, of their Formula One this year due to continuing COVID uh, restrictions. Uh, let's get the Formula One news hour started by thanking our sponsors. Our sponsors, as always... Um, and I believe we're going to be bringing uh, an additional one or two here in the next uh, couple of weeks. But uh, let's thank uh, Thinology. Let's thank um, Cloud Hub. Let's thank Give, Send, Go. And let's thank Moms for Liberty uh, for sticking with us and, and being a great uh, supporter of the Formula One News Hour. Um, some little bits of news. Not a lot, really, for the amount of time that it's been out. Uh, the, I guess the two big, two big pieces of news. Uh, one uh, is that um, Mercedes have kind of reshuffled some of the guys internally and the, the engineer that was responsible for them having the great success there of six, seven years in a row has been appointed back to, to the job that he had at that time. Uh, so really just him and the guy that had that job kind of switched positions. So. Uh, they want to get they want to get that guy who was responsible for you know the, the 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 design of that very successful car back into helping with the design of the car um, because they have admitted that uh, the car is not what they had thought it would be and um, they're not predicting a very bright 2023 after a rather I wouldn't say dismal I mean they were still up there in the top five but for them a dismal 2022 so that's. That's uh, the one piece of news. The other piece of news is we have been denied a press pass for the Miami Grand Prix. Now, Formula One just announced that they are starting a podcast called Formula Y. And it is a podcast coming out of the UK, of course, where Formula One is headquartered. And it's a podcast to bring everybody up to the news of what's going on in Formula One. Why they wouldn't just call yours truly, I have no idea. I mean, after all, we are called the Formula One News Hour. Of course, uh, we do um, a little bit more than I'm sure what they're going to do. They're going to answer questions about drivers and all that kind of stuff. And we're more focused on the history and the ongoing, uh, how, how Formula One got, got here today, and also on the races themselves. So anyway, we, we wish uh, Formula One Y good luck in their endeavor. Uh, the more people we have spreading the news about Formula One, then the better off we are. So let's get started with this week's uh, uh, podcast. And, and really, we're going to just focus on history uh, this week. And we're going to focus on a driver by the name of Mike Hawthorne. Mike Hawthorne was born in 1929, and he lived a, a relatively short life. He died in 1959. He was the son of a garage owner. Have you noticed something, uh, something really interesting about a lot of these early Formula One drivers who all knew, uh, knew a lot about their cars because they kind of grew up around cars and working on cars and everything. But anyway, Mike Hawthorne's dad owned a, a Jaguar, Maserati and Fiat dealership um, and kind of in the, in the Midlands. It, it, it grew up in West Yorkshire uh, in England. So. Um, he had a very early start. He actually did an apprenticeship. He went to university and then did an apprenticeship with a, a truck manufacturer, actually, um, uh, on, on how to fix them and repair them and design them and build them, all kinds of stuff, um, which was very common uh, in those, in those uh, days. For um, That's how a lot of engineers got their start, was by you know, getting either going to, going to uh, college full-time, technical college full-time, or doing, a, doing a, a, a degree and then doing an apprenticeship of some kind. So anyway, um, he got his start in racing when he was just 21 years old. 
and of all things like a lot of other people like Jim Clark started with a Sunbeam then Mike Hawthorne started with a Riley uh, which was a, a car very much like the Sunbeam actually it's a small family saloon car um, quite nice to drive uh, they had uh, Riley had something really interesting where most of the cars had their gear shifter in the middle between the two front seats Riley actually had their gear shifter down on the right hand side by the door uh, which was kind of interesting because you kind of had to put your leg around it uh, to get in and out of it. I, I actually drove um, a few Rileys in my in my time, not racing, but just driving a, driving the, the, the Riley car, uh, friends' cars and stuff like that. So very nice car to drive, but uh, that's how Mike Hawthorne got into um, motor racing. So two years later in 1952, um, Mike Hawthorne got out of driving uh, saloon cars and sports cars and started to focus on single-seater cars. In fact, he got his first, uh, first start driving for Cooper. It's amazing the influence that Cooper had on Formula One and motor racing. You know, everybody's very familiar with his, with his name, um, the, uh, the, the Mini Cooper. Uh, which was, uh, uh, of course, named after Cooper built uh, high performance engines. Is 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 how he ended up getting into a lot of a lot of car names. But he also built Formula Two and Formula One cars. But anyway, um, so Mike Hawthorne's first drive was driving a Formula Two car for Cooper, um, and it, strangely enough. Cooper was partnered with, of all people, Bristol. Um, if, you, if you don't know about the Bristol uh, cars, a very nice saloon car, luxury car, hand-built, um, uh, but they, they actually grew out of an aeroplane manufacturer. So during the war, the Second World War, uh, Bristol was, uh, which, and the Bristol, Bristol Motors, by the way, is named after the town of Bristol where they where they were born. So they were, they were building uh, aircraft uh, during the Second World War and and and, have, and still build aircraft today. Uh, but they formed out of the aircraft division. They started a car company, and um, actually was still going. It was finally put it put put out of business. They they introduced a new model in 2018 and it just wasn't successful and they had about 25, 30 employees so they finally shut it all down in 2020 but Bristol was a very nice car if you get a chance um, go out onto the web and, uh, and and you'll find them and in actual fact while I was looking up uh, for this uh, for this podcast there are three Bristols for sale here in the United States. Uh, they didn't build many of those cars. As I say, they were hand-built. So when you think of hand-built cars, if you're a car enthusiast, um, you'll think of Morgan. That's probably the most, you know, uh, common name in hand-built cars. Morgan still build cars one by one by hand today. They've been building them. They started as a motorcycle uh, uh, factory uh, years ago, but they still bought, they still build cars by hand today. And if you want a new Morgan, you've got to put your money down now and wait two to three years to get one. So anyway, back to Mike Hawthorne and his career. Uh, so Mike, um, he drove a Formula, Formula um, 2 for, for basically 1952. And it was during that time he, he, he won, he won uh, one of his first uh, Formula 2 races. And he, he did so well during that year that Enzo Ferrari uh, became very impressed with his capabilities. And Enzo offered him a, a, a drive in the Formula 1, Ferrari Formula 1 team, which he did. He went on to drive for Ferrari, in fact, for the next three years. Now, what's interesting about Mike is that he didn't win um, a lot of Formula 1 races. And Mike, in fact, Mike has the distinct record of winning the fewest Formula One races and still becoming Formula One world champion. But of course he did, he did come in, you know, second quite a lot. So really he finished in the top five when he finished races, because remember back then the cars were not reliable. But in the, in the years that, uh, that he drove uh, Formula One, uh, he only won three races, and that's a record, a record uh, that, that's still held today. It would be very interesting to see if anybody could win the Formula One World Championship today just by making sure they come in the top five. 
uh, especially with today's drivers and, and, and cars. Not, I'm not saying the drivers um, are any better today, but what I'm saying is that the, the cars are so reliable and the drivers uh, uh, <clears throat> don't have to worry about the, the car falling apart or having to drive a car that, that, you know, maybe the gear shifter doesn't work properly, the brakes don't work properly. Remember back in those days, the cars, the race cars didn't have drum, didn't have disc brakes, they all had drum brakes. Um, if you've ever driven a car with drum brakes, then you know that the braking is, um, let's say, uh, far from um, efficient. Uh, if you if if you want a chance to drive a drum brake car and find out what it's like, get an er get jump in an early Ford Mustang or something like that and try driving it re very fast and then trying to make the thing stop. Um, it, it's not an it's not an easy endeavor. Of course, those of us who are, who are older. Um, dr drove a lot of drum brake cars and remember the remember the hassles, um, especially if they weren't power assisted drum brakes. It was really really hard to make those cars stop. Anyway, back to Mike Hawthorne's career. So Mike, Mike, um, actually in 1955, Mike would go on and he would start driving. Um, and if for Jaguar in the Le Mans and the Sebring, uh, uh, not Sebring, it was it was called the Miami 12-hour race back then. And um, and in fact, 1955 was probably his most successful year. He he won Le Mans, he won the Miami, he came in second in three other races. He won the London uh, endurance race. Uh, so <clears throat> what's really interesting, he was a really good Formula One driver, but he he didn't. He didn't win as many Formula One races as he did the other type of races um, that uh, that he ended and won in. And, and during his career, um, Mike had a couple of uh, really serious accidents. Uh, and, and interesting enough, both of them in Jaguar D types. Well, I should say he 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 had one serious accident and another accident that he was blamed for. But we'll get to that in a moment. Let's talk about the serious accident. In the serious accident. Uh, in the Jaguar D-Type, he ended up um, with a lot of burns uh, on his body and, and it was actually uh, it's strange because it's what stopped him from getting drafted by the British military. Back in the 50s and 60s, the British were still still had the call-up, we called it, where you got, you got conscripted and you had to do two years of service in the military. Every male over 18 years of age had to do that. Um, but of course, he was in in university so he didn't get called up then and then he got into into driving and so they, they actually had a, a big thing in the house of commons in london of why this you know privileged driver um did not uh, get uh, called up into the british military so anyway that accident actually put the put the end to any chance that uh, he would serve in the military he would recover from that but in a subsequent, um, <clears throat> not, not 1955, it was 1956, the worst car accident or racing accident in the history of car racing occurred. And initially, Mike Hawthorne was blamed for it. And what happened was he was racing a Jaguar D-Type and he came up behind a um, Austin Healey 3000, another really nice British sports car. Um, look it up. You're, there's still a lot of them around over here. Very popular car. Um, anyway, he passed the the, the um, Austin Healey because the Jaguar D-Type is a different class, much faster car. And as he got past him, he got he saw a note from his pit crew to pit. So he hit the brakes hard to pit. And then when he hit the brakes hard to pit, the Austin Healey behind him swerved swerved out from behind him to miss hitting Mike and ended up hitting um, another another driver, Pierre Le, Le, Pierre, Pierre Levant, and um, Pierre's car left the track, hit an embankment, um, flew into pieces, and, and of course Pierre was killed, but it also killed 83 spectators. So when we go to the races now and we see all of these barricades and all of these fences and all of this security and everything, you know, it's... <clears throat> It didn't happen by accident. It's there because over the years, the accidents, the deaths, and and all this kind of safety, safety which wasn't a big concern then. You've you've heard me talk many times about going to Formula One races in the early days, and we could walk anywhere, we could go anywhere. We'd walk across the track, 
Um, and of course, all those things have now ended, not just for Formula One, but for all of motor racing. And um, as, as, as much as us old guys like to complain about it, it is something that is much, much better uh, for the sport. But so anyway, um, uh, Mike was initially blamed for that. And during that, during that uh, Le Mans race in 1956, uh, Pierre was driving for Mercedes, and so Mercedes pulled their team out of the out of the out of the Le Mans race in respect for the spectators and in respect for uh, Pierre. And they asked Jaguar to do the same, and Jaguar said, "No, we're not going to do it." And of course, a, uh, Mike also won um, the the Le Mans uh, race that year, and there was a lot of consternation around the fact that one Jaguar cont continued to race, but also that um, it uh, that they they uh, they, they celebrated. Uh, by uh, drinking the champagne and doing all those things uh, uh, after the race. And if, if you remember from a previous podcast, it was Don, Dan Gurney um, and, and um, AJ Foyt, Dan, Dan Gurney in particular, that started the drinking of the champagne thing that we still see today. But so um, anyway, so that was kind of a, a dark period uh, for Mike. And it, it was also something probably that signaled the end for him um, for his driving career. He, he had retired by the time he was 30 years old. Um, he retired uh, in, in late 1958. He died in 1959. We'll get to that in just a moment. But um, he had decided after that race that he was not going to continue racing and, 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 and for good reason. Uh, there's a lot of guys didn't make it out of the 50s and 60s alive. And they didn't make it out alive because their cars fell to pieces. They they had serious accidents. It was all kinds of stuff. Um, at the, because this was the formative years of real motor racing. You know, the the engines had been moved from the front of the car to the back of the car. You know, and they were they were messing with suspensions and aerodynamics of the cars. And in fact, I I, I was reading that in in um, in nineteen twenty three. Uh, which was the first year the the um, the, Le, the Le Mans race was was uh, it, that was the, it was the first year of the Le Mans twenty four hour race. The average speed and the high speeds of the car, rather the highest speeds the cars would get up to, was sixty six miles an hour. Okay, so you march forward just twenty thirty years, and in, in the nineteen fifties they were getting up to one hundred seventy one hundred seventy five miles an hour. If you look at the cars then and the and the engineering that was going into them, the fact that they could one get the cars to go that fast, but also to keep them on the track and to be able to control them uh, was just amazing. So so you know the, I think you've heard me say before the drivers would climb out of the, those cars with blisters on their hands and feet, you know, from changing gears so many times and the cars were heavy. They didn't have power steering, they they had all of the the, the aerodynamics and the and the G-forces and everything to deal with, but not like they do today. The, the G-forces G, G today are much harder on the drivers than they were back then. But even back then, they were still hard, and the cars, the cars were just, as uh, Mike Hawthorne put it one day, he said, you know, we're driving cars that were just uncontrollable. They're going down, this, they're going down the straightaway or something like that, and the car would just move to the left or right, and they, they had no control over it. They just, just did it. And, and actually, today, if you if you watch NASCAR, you'll talk, you'll hear the drivers talk about how the car just moves from the top of the track to the bottom of the track and vice versa because of the wind and the aerodynamics of what all the cars around them. So um, back then, uh, they didn't have anywhere near the engineering techniques and the engineering going into the cars as they have today. So in 1958, 1958, um, uh, Mike Hawthorne. Uh, would leave Ferrari and go to drive for BRM. Um, <clears throat> BRM, British Racing Motors, uh, was a well well known Formula One car uh, in the in the sixties, late fifties, sixties, and early seventies. They were well known because they were they were very very fast cars. They were also very unreliable cars. And Mike Hawthorne was so British. He's he's kind of you know the upper British uh, crust folks that, and he was staunchly British. And he decided that he couldn't 
drive anything other than a British Formula One car if it was offered to him. So he took them up on their offer and he lasted two races with them. That's all he lasted. Um, he only lasted two races. I think he finished, he, he finished them both, but the car, although it was very fast, it was very unreliable and he'd, he'd be in the pits more than he was out on the track. So after two races, uh, he went back to Ferrari and said, hey, can I come back to drive for you? And um, of course, Ferrari said yes. So um, BRM, uh, look up the history of that. In fact, we may do the history and the different manufacturers here uh, and once we get through all the drivers. But the BRM, uh, they were the first. They had a V16 engine, they had very, very popular V12 engines. Um, and they developed uh, really a huge amount of brake horsepower, but the cars couldn't stay together. In fact, the, the V16 engine only lasted two or three races before they had to ditch it because it couldn't, the transmissions couldn't hold together due, due to the amount of torque uh, going into the, going into the uh, gearbox from the engine. So that would be uh, 1958, really, at the end of it, Mike Hawthorne retired. Uh, that would be in October, November, at the end of the seasons there, and um, uh, he went to he went back to run uh, the garage that he had been left by his father. His father, who raced motorcycles, had uh, died in a car wreck uh, about three to four years earlier, and so during his racing career, Mike was running the garage and also you know driving Formula One cars and sports cars and stuff like that. Um, and so he went back to running his garage um, and uh, he died in, I think it was January 22nd of 1959. So just two, three months after he died, um, it, 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 sorry, two, three months after he finished his racing career, he died. And what's interesting is he died while racing a guy called Rob Walker. Rob Walker is also very famous uh, in the in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and even a little beyond uh, in the Formula One world. Uh, more as a manager uh, than anything else, but he, he he of course, like everybody else that's in Formula One, uh, you know, tried the tried the hint at uh, at driving. But anyway, um, uh, Mike Hawthorne had taken a Jaguar Mark One 3.4 liter, and he'd modif modified it. Uh, because he, he owned the dealership and he had all of this skill set and it, it was really a, a street racer is what, is what it was um, and uh, Rob Walker was driving a uh, Mercedes uh, 300 SL Gullwing and they were racing um, down the uh, I think it was A39 anyway it's a main thoroughfare um, uh, down in, uh, in, in, the, in the Midlands of England and, and so Mike Hawthorne passed uh, Rob Walker and after he got past him for the for no reasons nobody has ever figured out he lost control of the car which which he should not have done it wasn't like it was you know the visibility was bad or stuff like that um, and he ended up uh, hitting a tree uh, after he glanced off a truck he hit a tree and uh, was killed instantly now here's some interesting fake news Mike Hawthorne had kidney disease and he had already lost one kidney. And if he had not died in that wreck then, he would have only lived another two to three years before his second kidney would have failed as well and he would have died anyway. So they're saying that, that maybe he passed out. He'd started because, um, it, and, and as somebody who suffered from kidney damage uh, uh, <clears throat> after a car wreck, um, when you when your kidney goes doesn't work properly, you 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 it, it, you got bad blood. You get kind of wheezy and you pass out and all that kind of stuff. And they they think that's what happened to uh, Mike Hawthorne. Is that after because he had been apparently blacking out before that, and they think that after he passed, he just blacked out and the, and then the car just had no control. So anyway, that's the that's the life and times of Mike Hawthorne. Um, another interesting thing, um, every year Formula One hands out the Mike Hawthorne trophy to what Formula One considers the most successful driver of that year. And Lewis Hamilton has won that trophy 11 times. Now he's been Formula One champion seven. So that means four other times that Formula One have considered him to be worthy of the Mike Hawthorne trophy, being the best Formula One driver of that year. 
It's very, very interesting stuff going on um, in Formula One today, and we keep bringing it to you. So anyway, um, let's let's thank our sponsors again, uh, Phenology, um, a data center uh, providing cloud and um, co-location services in Austin, Texas, CloudHub, providing you a much better experience for social media than folks like uh, Facebook. Give, send, go. When you want to, when you want to start a uh, a campaign to raise funds for someone that's been hurt, or you just want to start a business, then crowdfunding. Uh, think of Give, Send, Go, and Moms for Liberty. Moms for Liberty doing a lot in the in the area of getting parents more involved in school and in, in, in what's going on in the school with our kids, and um, also getting parents involved in getting them onto school boards. So. Thank you very much to our sponsors, and of course, thank you to Andre Kuhn, who uh, makes this podcast look a lot better than it really is, and so we thank Andre uh, for being our producer and technical guru. So next week, uh, the Formula One News Hour is going to come to you from St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, That is because I have a nephew getting married and um, going up there on Thursday, uh, starting to, I'm going to drive up there from Austin. It's about a 12 hour drive. So I'm going to drive up to St. Louis. And then, so we'll bring qualifying to you from St. Louis on Saturday morning. And then we'll bring the race to you um, from St. Louis on Sunday morning. So until next week, this is Jonathan Steele, your host with the Formula One News Hour, saying thank you very much for joining us. <laughs>